warming factors. Uh, first, I'll start with climate. So climate is like, you know, we all know this. We drive to Oklahoma, we're going to see redder soils, right? And that is largely driven by the fact that it is hotter there. So there is more weathering of things. There's less organic matter accumulation. Um, so climate has a lot to do with soil. So I'd say the climate between here and these other fields we're going to, probably not different, right? Not really. Um, then you have um, organisms. So and when we say organisms, <coughs> humans are an organism, but when we talk about it as soil formation, we're thinking like, how did the soil form for thousands of years or hundreds of years maybe? And so for most of this soil's time that it's been here, it would have been prairie, right? So for a really long time, tall grass prairie, probably taller than the tallest person here at the, the peak, the heights of its uh, growth. And those prairie grasses would uh, had tremendous root systems and not just the prairie grasses but the root systems and then all the forbs that grew along with it and then all the organisms that live in association with those roots bacteria fungi protozoa everything else earthworms yes all those things so they made the soil the way it is um, to where it's deep and dark so yesterday we had about 20 students from the university of missouri here with us looking at soil and four soil scientists from iraq and they were i said man um that, you know, from a soil's perspective, I was like, I'm sorry that this wasn't more interesting and wild and crazy. And they're like, no, we're never going to see soils this black. <laughs> we're never going to see soils this black. We don't, we love the organic matter, the darkness of the soil. They were like, how is it possible that the organic matter is 2% still three in the three feet in the ground? I was like, well, those roots, those roots of those prairie grasses went so deep. They say it was in a prairie system, there's about 30% of the above, of the total plant is above ground, but 70% of the plant is below ground, which is crazy, right? And those are grasses, and they die a lot. They're dying almost every year. Most of the root system is dying every year. Of course, it's a perennial, so not entirely, but most of the root system is dying every year. Versus trees, where, so the people from Missouri, they believe that these soils form more under trees or a mixture of trees and grass. And those trees don't die often enough from a soil scientist's perspective. The trees and the wood, the tree is mostly stem, basically, and it's all growing and staying above ground and not cycling enough stuff back, not like roots of prairie grasses do. So that's what gave us these incredibly deep, dark soils that we have. So that's climate organisms and there's release. So where is it on the landscape? Um, so is it at the top of a hill, side of a hill, bottom of a hill? We know intuitively that there's going to be a difference in the type of soil you see there, right? So flat place the soil can form longer without rolling away or being washed away. Uh, pair of material and then time. So I'll say time first. The longer soil has to form before it gets buried by something else or you know like buried by more material flooding or glaciers running over or something like that. So when it has time, the more time it has the more it can sort of you know get organic matter to go that deep in the ground or get some clays to move from the top into the bottom or things like that. Um, so paramaterial. So paramaterial is really interesting here. Um, where we're going to go this later, uh, for those soil pits, we're right next to a creek. And so the, the creek is the parent material for those soils. And it's caused it to have some pretty interesting properties. Here, I think, you know, um, this is mapped as a tully, which is called a foot slope soil. So it's kind of related more to the hills this way where material over long period of time has kind of creeped from there to here and accumulated. And so because of that, this soil has a lot more clay than the soils we'll look at this afternoon. So that's the one thing I would say when, when we're flipping between pages and looking, oh, well, what is, what is Wyatt's? What is Kenny's? That's, you always have to keep that in mind that like, I think of a, I think of a field as almost like a kid, you know? So I have two kids, they're twins, and they could not be more different. If you've ever seen them, I mean, they're like, size is totally different. They act totally different. One never stops talking like his mother, and the other one never says hardly a word. Fields are like that too. Fields are kind of like kids, in that they can have, they have very, the very complicated set of characteristics. And so to try to compare two fields is almost like trying to compare two children. Not everything is exactly the same, even if they're pretty close to each other. So. I would just keep that in mind that this field has a little bit different pear material and also this field is considerably older than the two fields that we're going to look at later in terms of its time that the soil took to form.
a little bit of cover crops, but we mainly chop them and feed them in the feedlot. Kind of starting on a little bit of no-till, but not very much yet. So. Right now, I always graze it in the fall with cattle. I probably graze 80 percent of my acres. Conventional tillage, corn soybean rotation. That's about it, right? No carbon crop channel. Alright. Anything else you want to say, Wyatt? Why do you know is this had a history of over application in addition to the grazing? So, yeah, it'd just be stuff out of the feedlot, feed just, just a little bit at a yeah. time. Beginning of the month and pulled soil samples at all three locations. Um, and we used the, the uh, hydraulic truck mounted probe, so we got samples down to 36 inches. And that's what you're looking at on, on the front page of uh, each of the three stops is the, the data back from the, the K-State lab. And so, you know, Wyatt already explained that there has been some manure. I would say that is likely why we're seeing the high uh, soil pest P levels at the near surface. Um, that's pretty common when we, we see a history of, of manure um, applications to fields. The answer is, we've got roots all the way to the bottom. So we dug this, this is 48 inches here. I've got roots at 44 inches. Peter, did you have one any deeper? Um, I've got one all, I was just gonna put the tape up and get the depth, but I've got one showing all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. Can you so, tell what type of root? Um, I can't. <laughs> you know, I know corn root or, or soybeans, or can you tell? No, probably, I, I can't really tell. Um, but if they're white and fresh like this, they're last year's root, so it would be bean, right? Yeah, so it would be a bean root. They can, um, so the way that rooting systems work on crop plants is, crop plants are kind of the flip side of prairie plants, so most of our crops have for the most part, have about 70% above ground, 30% below ground, roughly. Not that I like to measure roots, that's hard work. <laughs> Root measurements are tough. Um, but they uh, they put most of their, they do most of their work above ground, right? That's what we're gonna harvest and take to the, take and sell or use. So with a soybean plant, it's got, it could have a rooting system, it could have a rooting system six feet deep, no problem, but most of the roots are going to be up here, right? So about 70% of the roots are in the upper half of the rooting system. So if the rooting system is, okay, technically six feet, but I'd say probably most soybean roots are probably going to be in the upper foot, most of the upper foot, maybe the upper two feet, and then from there it's going to drop off pretty fast. But So I haven't done texture by feel here yet, but this is probably a silky clay loam in the surface. And then here, so it's probably, oh, I'd say 30, 30 maybe 35% clay here. And once we get to here, this is where we're going to get into lagoon building material. It's going to jump solidly over 40, 45, 50%. And then you see here where the excavator bucket get, or, smear marks change again we've entered 60 percent clay here so probably 55 to 60 percent clay so the clay content again jumps right here so at 29 inches it jumps so if you need a lagoon you could put a lagoon here what i'd say here is really noticeable is the clay content here at 17 to 17 inches is lower and then we we jump up and then we jump into a whole new territory here of about 29 inches the clay content really jumps and that's where, uh, moisture-wise, it gets really dry down there. So it's not bad. The surface is a little dry, but down we've got good moisture down here, no problem. It gets drier at 17, but it gets real dry at 29. And that's just following <coughs> along with those clay contents. We just haven't had enough. It's not bad. I mean, you can come down and feel it. And I want you all to come down here and check it out and feel it if you're able to because it, you, you'll see like people are like, oh, it's dry, but it's not bad. It's not bad. This upper upper part's starting to get dry again, but it, there's great moisture right here in this field. It's not bad here, but down here, <clears throat> the clay is still somewhat tacky, but it is, that clay is gonna keep all that water for itself. It's not gonna give it up to the plant, not really. And the other thing that's interesting about plant roots is they only exploit about 5% of the soil volume. So there's so much soil here that they're never going to see. 
So they spend a lot of their time going down cracks and through earthworm channels. Have you seen any earthworm not channels? Not here, I've not seen one. I haven't seen one either, but he's a great earthworm hunter. So if any of your earthworm <laughs> questions gonna go right there. Um, but I have not actually seen an earthworm, a cast or a worm itself um, here in this field yet. So earthworms and root channels and old cracks are like, they're super highways for where the roots are gonna go and be. Um, that's where they're gonna wanna be. They can't, they're gonna have a really hard time going through you know anything that had been compacted or whatever but also they're going to have a hard time getting through most of the places in this clay so the places where we have seen them is squished in between cracks so peter found like a really yeah i've got a tortured looking path right there <laughs> for a root earthworm so if we think about the night crawler that we might buy for fishing bait that is uh, an anisic um, earthworm it actually is is non-native it came from from Europe uh, originally brought to the east coast uh, in ship ballast that was emptied out to haul, haul cargo back to to uh, Europe and um, has basically moved across uh, the United States. Uh, Kansas uh, is a transition zone, um, but we find uh, what would be native uh, earthworms to North America that were not wiped out by glaciation. And so um, I, I would venture to guess that what we, the worm that I found here in the pit wall it's probably a native earthworm. It, it's smaller in size and a lot of the burrows I'm finding have been backfilled and that's characteristic of uh, those uh, endo, endogenic earthworms um, that are, are tend to be more of our native species, whereas the anisic, we would find a nice clear burrow that's open uh, all the way to the surface and not backfilled. That's where we tend to find those midden piles pushed out at the surface. Not at so, all. not really. This whole thing is, um, so, the whole thing is filthy. Yep. This whole thing is not differently. So, this is considerably younger environment than the foot floor. So, you see where those cows are over there, right? <coughs> you go, you go that way, there's a stream terrace where the cows are, there's a stream terrace, and then it goes up to a foot slope. So, where we 
matter where it lies, is more equivalent to where the cows are. It's a considerably older landscape than here, but this close to a stream. It happens over there in that pit even more. This is a buried soil. There's a floodplain under here. This is a floodplain today, modern floodplain, and this is a buried soil. So there is an old soil here, and then this is all new material on top. So the organic carbon tells me that. Also, there is charcoal down here. So there's charcoal right there by that nail. And the other bit over there, the students brought me probably five different chunks of charcoal. And um, so this is definitely an old surface. So now the question is, if you're like, well, how long has this stuff been here on top? Probably, I don't think it's like, sometimes we might say, oh, this got here after the settlers got here and we did tillage and the soil around. I think this is older than that. This is a, probably in the thousand to something years old, at least, that thousand or more. So we'd actually radiocarbon date that uh, the piece of charcoal. It felt, it felt like spending $500 and wanted to know real bad. That's what we could do. We could radiocarbon date that piece of charcoal to find out. Um, but, but, so this is a younger environment. So, the pH is 8. 8.1, 8.1, 8.1, 8.2. So, as this stuff floods out, it comes out of the floodplain, it's picking up material, right? So it's picking up. We've got a lot of limestone in this whole Flint Hills landscape. So that's where all this high calcareous uh, carbonate material comes from. So calcium carbonate, so I hit this with acid, the whole thing, Fizz, which yesterday when the students started doing this, I was like, huh, I didn't know that was going to happen. And then I pulled out the lab data, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, I guess I didn't pay attention. This whole thing is calcareous. You're probably never going to have to lime these fields, this field or that field. And unfortunately, you might have to lime the surface someday, but the, down low, there's plenty of it. So all these white films and threads that are down there, is where calcium carbonate has accumulated in past root channels. So there's just tons of lime here, um, just naturally. So that's how I know it's young also. But there, there's essentially um, not any clay here to speak of. So if you look at the pile, the pile, the chunks are all fairly rounded. Over at Y, it's all the chunks on that the pile that were like lighter colored pile were all like little rectangles, that's another sign of clay. So this is just a really silty material. There's, this is like a silt loam, maybe 25% clay back to the sulfur pile. Ah, that's yeah. a good question. Moisture, we run out right here. That's why I put this nail here. At 44 inches, it's getting dry. Sure. Sure. So it is plenty <laughs> moist. The surface is a little yes. dry. We'll probably just need some moisture like back. Surface. But Also, you know, not having the, the the mechanical disturbance, um, you know that that's an important factor. Um, you know, there's the the activity of plowing. You know, will um, you know cause some earthworms to to decease, um, but also the vibrations. Um, you know, they're fairly sensitive to, to the vibrations, and so, um, you know, it just, you know, will cause them to, to migrate to somewhere that's, that, uh, you know, they can establish their burrows and, and not have to, you know, 
redo it every year on that heavy clay at the bottom um you know same thing an earthworm's going to have to work pretty hard to move through that clay here where we've got a, a you know a, a good texture throughout um we don't have any you know we don't have sandy material we don't have that real heavy clay material you know we've got a pretty uniform texture so that's going to create a, a good environment for them we tend near neutral uh ph's is where we'll tend to see you know good earthworm populations when we're looking in in, in native soils um under native conditions um so I think you know paying attention to to uh, to pH um, certainly some of our our chemicals could have have impacts on our earthworm population, but um, it, it's just an area that we don't have a lot of, of hard data on. Here, this half of this field probably hasn't been tilled in probably 15 years. Uh, we have done cover crops, we've had some success with cover crops. Last couple of years it was just total flop, but I still believe in cover crops. Uh, we have uh, probably once or twice, maybe. Yeah, we just started cover crop probably the last five years. It has had manure spread on it. Probably twice, maybe once for sure, maybe twice. And I'm pretty sure our earthworms are bigger than Steve Frank's earthworms. Right <laughs> <laughs> and they're little piles of poop. Everybody knows what poop looks like, but the earthworm poop just looks like a bunch of little marbles. Yeah. Like they're just little marbles stuck together. So first you see them here, and then you keep looking, and then they're pretty soon it's like, oh, well, I'll just take a little piece of the bottom, and they're all the way down. And I just, I don't think I've seen earthworms that far in the ground. Dark, you can see the 